Hello, friends. I want to just reach out there and give you all a big hug and uh, reach through this digital separation. And as much as we can feel like we're together, that you're here with us in our little uh, studio here, so we can be a family together. Father, we thank you uh, that this would be your word, your spirit, your truth, your love that's coming through here, Lord, and not just any ideas that I might have, but Lord, speak to us from your word, but speak to us yourself right now so that we can understand. Thank you, Yeshua. Amen. Well, I want to talk about this amazing statement Yeshua made comparing what happens in the end of the end times to the days of Noah and also the days of Lot. Let's read it. This is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. And we'll read first the section about Noah in verse 26 and 27, and then about Lot. Luke 17, verse 26 and 27. And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. The Son of Man, Yeshua is referring to himself. I'd like the translation, actually, the Son of Adam there, that he will come. He's talking about when he returns, the day of his return. They, the people, the time of Noah, ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. By the way, we'll get back to that later, but notice that that happened until the very day that everything was destroyed. Not seven years ahead of time or three and a half years ahead of time, but up until the day that everything was destroyed. And uh, so he gives another comparison, same thing, the next couple of verses, but now comparing it to Lot. Likewise, of uh, Luke 17, 28 to 30. Likewise, as it also was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day, oh, again, on the very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Wow. You know, it's amazing. Yeshua has such love and such grace and such power and such anointing that he says things, and it's so beautiful. I get wrapped up as it was in the days of Noah, but the content is like a bomb. So let's look at this a little bit. First of all, he's making a comparison that goes from what's happening in the end of the end times to what's going on in the book of Genesis and the other direction, what's happening in the book of Genesis, like what's happening in the end times. So we can look at that parallel, and I feel like the Lord is calling us to step into the reality of this. Don't read this as a poetry book or a theology book. This is prophecy starting to come to pass now in our generation. So it's either we're going to step into it or it's going to step on us. So let's just look at this for a minute. It's pretty uh, intense language. First of all, I want to mention, um, Ariel said he, it, it's not clear exactly how long that he prepared the ark. Well, I want to say before he prepared the ark, he preached the message. Noah wasn't just an ark builder. He was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible tells us, long before he ever started building the ark. In fact, as I understand it, his grandfather was named Metushalach. It was a prophecy that when he died, that the, the flood would come. So I think that Noah really grew up with this. He's 600 years old here. I think he was sort of preaching for 500 years. And uh, it's kind of tough looking at the results. But... Anyway, so this is the time, and it's saying, now let's step into this together, and Yeshua said it will be like that on the days right before he comes back. Well, it's starting to get to be like that now. And uh, this is the framework back then for what's happening now. And we need to look at this framework. We need to make sure that we're in the right framework. Sometimes people take little details and they start prophesying and they get all kinds of cultic thinking. Wait a minute, Yeshua said, it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like 
the days of Lot. That's the, that's the big picture. Let's make sure we're inside uh, the big picture there. I also want to mention that Peter, in both his first letter and his second letter, he goes back and he also says, again, he repeats this, in the end times, it will be like, particularly in the days of, uh, of Noah. Well, Let's get into this a little bit here. Uh, this is a sad time. When we look at the overall picture, it's very intense. What we have there is a time of huge judgment. In the time of Noah, the entire world, known world, was wiped out by a flood, everyone except for Noah's family. In the time of Lot, everyone in his city or this group of cities were all burned up with fire, except for Lot's family who barely made it out of there, half of his family. And he said, it's going to be like that. So what we understand, what he's saying here in the simplest picture is the end times is moving toward a day of huge judgment and punishment. On the day that it happens, it happens quickly. God doesn't need a lot of time to bring a, a, uh, an extermination type judgment. That he can do in a moment. What takes time is when he's warning people and bringing a lighter tribulation to get us to repent. That's the time leading up. But the final event happens in a, in a moment. Once that rain started, once that fire start, started, it was too late. There wasn't, you couldn't repent then. And it happened immediately. He said in both cases, everything was destroyed in one day. On the day that they left, on the day that Lot stepped out, on the day that Noah went into the flood, into the, into the ark, on the day that happened, everything was destroyed. Well, how are we going to compare those, how are we going to unify those two models? Uh, how could it be both like? The flood of Noah was worldwide and it was water. The destruction of Lot was local, but it was fire. Well, I suppose it could be, we could put them both together and it'll be steam. Won't be either water or fire. I don't think so. But it seems to me the only obvious way to reconcile that is to understand if you put them both together, we're talking about a day, one day, which we understand to be the same day that Yeshua returns, is a day of worldwide flood of fire. I don't know what degree that's a physical fire or a fire from heaven. We don't know what exactly it was in the, in the days of Lot either. But a, a fire will come and destroy the things of this world. Peter goes on to describe that. And he says it will be so hot. It will be like the, the, the elements of this earth will, will melt. Almost like a, a, a giant international uh, nuclear uh, war, but, but even greater. He's saying that the elements will melt. I want you to notice also that in the days of Noah, the, the Noah's flood was, was, we say, cataclysmic. It was huge. And it wasn't just, oh, the animals in the ark. No, it was a huge flood that destroyed everything, killed all the dinosaurs, for instance. And it, as far as I can understand, there weren't big mountains before that. The flood ripped the world apart and, and, and caused the, 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 the mountains and the ravines and the water to come down. And it, it was a huge huge event. And then Peter said, we're looking forward to this next heaven and earth, which will be like the days it was before Noah and after Noah. In other words, it wasn't that planet earth disappeared, but the whole earth was ripped and changed and burned and flooded. And then we came out into a new world. He said, that's what it'll be like right before Yeshua comes back and after. And so we're looking for this cataclysmic event. Now, Let's also realize here that this is not just water and fire. This is a moral judgment. It's a judgment against sin. It's a judgment against rebellion. It's a, it's a judgment against human cooperation with evil angels against God. Humans cooperating with evil angels, how much could they cooperate? Well, a lot. Let's look at the next, the next verse, and it's, I'd have to say, in Genesis chapter 6, one of the saddest portions of the whole Bible. But here it talks about um, sexual perversion between fallen angels and men as, and women, as far as I can understand. Let's read this. Genesis 6, verses 4 to 6. And it was this event that caused 
God to bring the flood. Verse 4 to 6. And since this is Hebrew, I'll read in Hebrew. And if Elim are you by Aras Begamim Ahem, the Gamma Rechen, Asher Yavo, Bnea Elohim El Bnota Adam, Vialdulahem, Hema Giborim, Asher Meolam, and She Hashem. Vayar Adonai ki Rabba Raat Adam Baarat, the Holy Yetzer Machshevot Libor Rak Ra Kolayom. Vayinechem Adonai ki Asat Adam Baarat, Vayita Tsev El Libo. It's hard even to read this. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great upon the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Whew. First of all, is another teaching, and I'm not going to go there, but to try to understand how much our evilness hurts God. He's our father. We're his children. And we rebel and we do horribly evil things for those of you who are a parent. Try to imagine if, you're, if your child became a mass murderer, a terrorist, a rapist, it, 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 it just... He grieved his heart so bad. Can you imagine? He grieved in the part where he said, I'm just going to have to wipe everybody out. Uh, it's so deep. The pain of God here is beyond comprehension. But like I said, I've got another teaching, and I don't want to go on in there in that direction. And it also says how evil people were, that the whole world was evil. But in this particular passage, it's speaking about a particular kind of evil. Now it said there were giants on the earth. The word for giants here in Hebrew is nephilim. The word nephilim seems to indicate is the same word as nophel, fallen. And it also speaks, of course, later on in Second Peter and Jude about angels that left their domain. They fell. They came down. Fallen angels. Let's just remember, God made all the angels good, but they had a level of free choice. And it seems that about a third of them rebelled with Satan and one of their acts of rebellion was to come to this earth and involved human women in sexual perversion. Um, now, that's reading a lot into this passage, so we can't prove it a, a, a totally, but it seems to be what's being talking of here. But what I want to say here is that it's talking about in the end times, in any case, let's bring it up till today, I don't want to argue about theology. It's talking about that in the days right before Yeshua returns, there's going to be a massive wave, not just of sexual immorality, but of sexual perversion. You know, we're seeing things today that when I was a child, I couldn't even imagine this. I'm talking about before I was a believer, as a sinner. I mean, and, uh, what was then, it's like we had sexual immorality. Sexual immorality today seems almost holy compared to the sexual perversion that's going around the world today. It's just, it's just crazy. But what seems to be saying here is that sexual perversion is not only human lust. It's demonically inspired. It's got, when in, in all the, the perversion that you see in the world today, it's not just men and women being lustful. It's men and women being empowered by demonic forces that pushes it to a level of just not adultery or immorality, but to perverse acts. Now, this, this is believable today. I don't know if somebody could, would have even believed that. 50 years ago, but today it's like it's almost like headlines. It's, I mean, I mean it's a, do you, do you, do you turn on the social media, you'll see what's happening with that. It's, it's happening right in front of us. A couple of things I thought about that. One is that for those of us men who are trying to walk in righteousness, I can't speak for the women, that the women must there must be something parallel to that, but for the men, you know, we, we face these things and you fight it and you can feel that. Here's what I wanted to say there, that you can feel, wait a minute, 
this isn't just me being lustful. I mean, my goodness, I'm, we're not that out of control. It's that you're not battling with your own feelings. We're battling with a, a, a demonized set of um, social media and entertainment and um, a bombardment of, of uh, digital type of pornography that is, is imp evilly empowered. It's not just it's not just you feeling lustful. Now, so and what we see that that's happening today right now and we realize it's a spiritual battle. The women have they're obviously their own side of it as well, equally. So I'm saying the, the battle over sexual perversion is worldwide, and it's also demonically inspired. It's not just uh, uh, human flesh. Um, I think that's enough for this, but let's go on to the next one. There's a second element that was in that world right before um, uh, Lot and Noah, and that is violence. Let's look at the continuation of this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. Vayomer Elohim la Noach, ketz kol basar ba lefanai, ki malah haaretz chamas mipnehem, hinani mashchitam et haaretz. He says, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh, something that Ariel was saying, it's not just the end times, it's the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them uh, with the earth. Now, a um, couple comments here from the Hebrew, you might not notice this, but the word for violence here is the word Hamas. Now, it seems to be a coincidence that there's the, the terrorist organization among uh, the Gazans is called the Hamas, which when you say that in Hebrew is Hamas, it sounds the same. It's actually not the same word, but it sounds exactly the same. So that when Israelis refer to Hamas, they're saying the same word here, that the earth will be filled with violence. It says in Hebrew, you're reading it, it says the earth will be filled with Hamas. Well... I don't think that's just, I mean, it's a coincidence, but it's, uh, it certainly is giving us a lesson here. Is the earth being fulfilled, filled with a spirit of Islamic radicalism, terrorism, hatred? Well, not the whole world, but a large part of it is. It's like this is happening right before us. And there's a type of violence coming today that's not just Islamic, it's secular. It's that we, we think movies having today are coming out. I'm about to do a, a, a small a, a video with a friend in Korea talking about this new Netflix film, but it's just that there's a, a type of violence across the world today that is so bizarre. It's just violence for violence for violence and, and it said that the earth would be filled with that so now we as believers find ourselves standing in a world with sexual perversion on one side and, and physical violence on the other side and both of them are demonically empowered in other words with help from fallen angels both on sexual perversion and on violence I also want to mention that I mean, I'm interpreting this. You don't have to agree with that. But I've seen a lot of times, a lot of times, uh, uh, a, what seems to be a sweet, young Muslim boy that got brainwashed to do a terrorist attack. And he goes in. He, and those who survive say, you talk to him and he's sweet again. He says, well, I don't, I don't know what got into me. I just, it just they got, And you see, it's, it's not him. It's a demonic spirit. And there's a violence that's coming across in, in, in the secular world, in the communist world, in the Islamic world. And, you know, in Israel, we have both. We, I mean, we have everything uh, here. And uh, I'll get to that in just a moment. It also said, I will destroy them who destroy the earth. That's quoted later on by John in the book of Revelations. God will destroy those people who destroy the earth. So for us, the environmental problem is not just a question of global warming. It's a question that the sin of mankind has ruined God's beautiful creation. And God's going to punish us for that, among other things. Um, by the way, it was interesting to note that, I don't know if you saw that, but it said about Noah, it says they were going on doing business and marrying. And the version of, about Lot, he said they were going on doing their business. He didn't even say they were marrying. I mean, it's amazing. We're getting to the point where it's almost like marriage is, 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 is getting uh, out of date. But uh, so let's look at this for a moment. We are found, all of you, 
all of us who want to follow the Lord, who our hearts have been turned to Him, we find ourselves in this predicament, whether you're here with us in Israel or around the world, the same predicament. We have demonic violence on one side, sexual perversion on the other, and a lot of lies and brainwashing going on in the media and the news all around us to call what's bad good and call what's good bad. So it's crazy. We're right here uh, in the midst of all that, and you are in the midst of that too. It's a huge challenge, and I want to encourage you. You say, well, Asher, this hasn't been very encouraging so far. Well, first of all, I want to say we're dealing with some very difficult issues. So did Noah. So did Lot. And something good came out of it in the end, so we have to be... But if you don't look, you don't realize what we're up against, how can you be encouraged? Because then you're just going to live in a fantasy and you're going to get destroyed by it. Well, uh, let's go on. Here now it starts with a little bit of good news in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. And he said, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we, and he said, not only will the days be like Noah, the days of Noah, but we, the saints of God, we're also in that position. We are, Yeshua is the great Noah, but we are the people walking in the footsteps of the righteousness. We're finding ourselves like Noah did. Noah preached against the unrighteousness in his days. Lot, the Bible tells us he didn't really even get a chance to preach against it, but he was tormented by it. So we are found in that same way. We're trying to preach righteousness in a darkened world and we're being tormented by the situation around us. And God said in this bad situation, in the time of Noah and the lot, was the worst possible situation. But he's saying, listen, so you can be encouraged by that. And I want to say, you and I and anybody who wants to, anybody who's listening, you can find grace with God through, not through, not just through Noah, but through Noah's great, 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 great grandson who was who? Yeshua. Yeshua, the great Noah, who came to give us grace and favor. We can receive grace in the middle of an evil world. Anyone who wants it, that's the good news. You can find grace. Hallelujah. And when we find grace, we can give grace back to God. We can make God happy. God looks at all the evil in the world and it pains his heart. But when he looks at us who are here in the midst of all this evil and, and sure we're making a lot of mistakes and falling, but, but we're being strengthened by his word and by love and the grace of Yeshua and walking in, in the power and holiness of the Spirit of God, we can give grace back to God. We can make him happy right in the midst of this world. And thank God for us, we're not alone like no one lot was. There's thousands and millions of other people standing with us in the world today. And we're very uh, excited about that. So imagine how they felt. Imagine how you feel. Look at their example and overcome. Now, I may be reading a little bit into the text here, but I don't know. I, I was thinking Noah, uh, Noah and Lot struggled themselves against fighting depression in their own lives, what they saw. I mean, Noah was Noah didn't happen, just happen to get drunk. I don't think he was just a drunkard. I think he was looking at the, he had the promises of God, but he was also feeling pretty desperate about his situation and said Lot was tormented. So if you, if you struggle with depression, with, with hopelessness sometimes, well, don't fall into that, but realize that men and women of God in every generation have fought against that. Be encouraged right now. Hallelujah, because we have found grace in the eyes of God. Amen. I want to give you one more verse, and uh, which is even more of an encouragement. Because when Noah comes out of the ark, God makes a covenant with him. And what does he see? He shows him something, which is a vision, which is a real thing. It was a real natural phenomenon, but it was a vision of the future. Let's read it. I'm going to shorten this up. Let's look in Genesis chapter 9. We'll skip over verse 11. Let's start in verse 12. Genesis 9, 12 and 13 is our last verse for today. Vayomer Elohim zot ot habrit asher ani noten beni uvenichem uven kol nefesh chaya asher itchem ledorot olam et kashti natati be'anan vayta leot brit beni uven haaretz. And he says, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. 
Uh, did you get that? That includes you and me. Hallelujah. <laughs> we can, by, the, by faith in Yeshua, we, get in, we come into the new covenant and the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of Noah. We just walk right in to all the good promises. Verse 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, you know, the rainbow is a real uh, natural phenomenon. If you ever notice that, you have to have the sun behind you if you're going to see the rainbow. Because what is the rainbow? The rainbow is the light of the sun reflecting through the water after a rain, the water that's still in the air, reflecting through that and making an arc in front of you. So what you're see- why is it curved? Because it's the curve of the sun coming through and then reflect, refracting, refracting through the water in the air, and you see that curve. Now, that's the natural phenomenon. But God is saying, this is a sign for me. If I understand the text correctly, this was, this was the first time anybody had ever seen a rainbow. It was the first time there ever was a rainbow. And he says, this is a sign of the covenant in between. Not only for you to see it, but when you see it, it's supposed to speak to you. It's a symbol. One of it, it's a reminder that God is making a covenant of grace with us for the Dorot Olam. Hallelujah. That, that, it's, that He has eternal purposes for us. But there's more to it. The, the, the rainbow is reflecting the light of the sun. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians that the sun is an image of the glory of God reflected in the light of Yeshua and that we are going to be glorified with Him. So it's a promise of the people of God being glorified. It's a, people of, uh, it's a picture of us being unified in harmony, beauty, glory. The rainbow... People, God's not interested in rainbows. He's interested in people. He's interested in you. You're part of that rainbow. I'm part of that rainbow if we will believe and walk in faithfulness with Him. This is God's plan for all the nations of the world that anyone, He says, anyone who chooses can walk, can step into this through the death and resurrection of Yeshua, through the grace of the new covenant and all the eternal covenants of God. We come in and God will form us into a rainbow. So what he calls in the new covenant an an ecclesia, the people of God, all different nations, different colors, different languages, but we're all shining, we're all in harmony, diversity, harmony, beauty, unity, glory. He says that's God's plan for us. So in the midst of it, I want to say that you and I, just like Noah and like Lot, we hold this promise. This is God's good promise and His good plan. So yes, that's it. We live in today in a similar situation in which we have the the evil around us and yet we hold the grace of God. You and I, we are part of a remnant of faith, a remnant of grace. We're holding the promises of grace to be like that rainbow, and we're taking, talking to the whole world around us like the days before. No, come, you can be part of the rainbow. You can get out of the darkness of this world. And I want to say to you, be strengthened. We feel it here in Israel. We have all the news media against us, jihad, communism, radical left, radical this, the the, Orthodox Jews that don't like it. That's just so much stuff, and we're in it. But that doesn't make any difference. Be strong. Hold the grace of God and know that the promises of God are greater than any of this. Because after the flood comes a new world, a new creation, a new heavens, new earth, the kingdom of God, people raised from the dead, shining with light. When he came out of it, God was basically saying to him the same thing he said to Adam and Eve. Paradise, Garden of Eden is going to be restored. Hallelujah. And you're going to be part of it. Amen. So let me pray for you and then we'll end up with it. Father, I just pray for everyone here. Like Noah, like Lot, we're facing difficult situations, but like them, we receive the promises of grace, of a vision of paradise restored, and a harmony and rainbow world and new creation. New earth. Hallelujah, Father, I pray for everyone here to be strengthened by hope, to overcome the evil and darkness of this world, and be people of that shining rainbow and the beautiful new creation promises that we have by grace through Yeshua our Messiah. Amen.